This week I completed reading uh, Saf and Snyder. I, um, this is a two week update and I did enough problems uh, last week and that by itself could have probably been a, a, a small update but in this update I'm going to talk about completing uh, Saf and Snyder and then the problems that I've done recently. Now unlike Wade and of course now I, I, I guess I get to mention chapter 8 the latter part uh, unlike Wade where when I finished the book I was not going to do any problems in the last couple of chapters anymore so I could just pack it up boom boom done and I showed the notebooks and this is what I had I'm not doing that here because there's plenty of work that I still need to do so uh, chapter 7 with conformal mapping really put it together for me uh, made me understand really what the book was all about and that's and I, I, I've started doing work uh, problem sets, uh, problems in chapter 7, but I want to do a few more. And uh, the transforms uh, chapter, Fourier transforms, Laplace, uh, Z transforms, even Hilbert transform. Uh, very interesting, and I want to do some problems as well. So I, I'm, I'm nowhere near done. I think I probably have about another month of uh, problems to work on uh, for uh, Saf and Snyder course completed so the, everything has been read and uh, there you have it and then for problems I have done some problems uh, in the early part of chapter 7 um, but again I plan to do problems in here all the way through so I've got I've got a long ways to go uh, because I really enjoyed conformal mapping I got me this book uh, which I'm gonna use I'm gonna read from as I do problems and that may extend how much I do for complex analysis uh, this first cycle. I don't really know. But this book is really, really good. Very well uh, written, very easy to read, approachable. Uh, it's actually, it's effectively a, uh, a complex analysis book. I mean, it talks about, and here it is, and it's a Dover book. Some Dover books can be hit and miss. Some of them... And I even bought another book that was about conformal mapping that I think is going to be pretty much useless because it's just too high level and it doesn't have any problems. It's just kind of like a treatise on conformal mapping with the, the, uh, some really advanced stuff. I just didn't understand. But this one is the opposite. This one is meant at my level and uh, it doesn't have answers in the back, unfortunately. But when you look through the uh, table of contents, it's just a, it's very much like a Saf and Snyder, except what I really like is it focuses a lot on harmonic functions, and this is what exactly what is missing from Saf and Snyder. I think Saf and Snyder, I like that the, they did small harmonic functions sections at the end of each chapter, but they never really put a bow on it. They tried to with conformal mapping, but it doesn't work, because when they talk about conformal mapping, they'll talk about the mapping itself, and then they'll plop in a, uh, a harmonic function, and you're like, where did this come from? And so where it came from is explained, I believe, in this book. So it, it really is just like any other book, but it, but it starts with harmonic functions. Very useful. Pretty sure I'm going to read some of this, if not the whole thing. I may even take notes. I'm not even sure. Then it does what, what Saf and Snyder does, analytic functions, complex integral, um, and then conformal mapping, of course, it's a conformal mapping book, so it goes crazy on conformal mapping. It doesn't really have a lot of residue theory. It doesn't. It just has a little bit. But boy, is it well written. I mean, I, I, I just got it, and out of the box, I started reading, and I was like, wow, this is a really, really good book. So I'm looking forward to reading this book as I finish up the Chapter 7 problems. And uh, yeah, I plan to do that. And then when I get to chapter 8 problems, uh, I do want to do some uh, Fourier transform uh, work. Uh, not sure how much I'm going to do of this book. The, this book is really also another excellently well-written book. And it's really an encyclopedia. Effectively, it's an encyclopedia of Fourier analysis theorems with proofs. That's really what it is. It's a little bit uh, idiosyncratic. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's really not... A standard textbook it doesn't have problems big problem that it doesn't have problems obviously it doesn't have solutions because it doesn't even have problems but I do want to read from it I have read some and it reads really really well and it's very broad and also deep 
in when it comes to Fourier analysis. And so I plan to read some of this book as well as I wrap up chapter 8. So actually, uh, Seth and Snyder has a very long tail of work, uh, unlike Wade, which was kind of like an abrupt, like, okay, I finished the book, I don't, I'm not going to do anything for the last chapter, so I'm going to do another round anyways. Uh, and so then when it comes to the, the work itself, the last time I showed the tail end of chapter 6, Okay, so this is actually an update for 6, 7, and 8. And uh, for chapter 6, I did more homework. Um, didn't do as well with some of the problems that, that I tried in the latter part, but I think I did enough to understand where I could have gone. Uh, but then I got it got better. Then it got better. Uh, so yeah, the argument principle. Yeah, six, six, second 6.7 didn't work out so bad for me. And then, um, yeah, and these problems where you estimate the zeros, uh, where you say how many it's got, this worked out pretty well. I, uh, I was able to do them with not any difficulties. Found a nice little, another little handout, meromorphic functions. Kept it, put it in the book. So this book is done, and this is actually my 16th notes notebook of this quest. Uh, and then when it comes to chapter 7, I've already shown the notes. I do remember that. Uh, and then I've done a bunch of homework. Um, yeah, the first section, basic mappings. Uh, I sort of got it, uh, but then it threw me for a spin uh, on problem number 4. Uh, yeah, so but I got to do problem number 2 correctly, mostly. I figured out that I had to use the uh, the conjugate operator, and then I got the answer that I was expected. That's good. Uh, then when I got to the Dirichlet problem, boy, I was like, I need to read more. I went and I read a bunch more about the Dirichlet problem, uh, but I'm still I'm gonna have to wait to read more of that conformal mapping book to really understand it. Uh, but I still I worked it. I worked it. Uh, I got close, but not. Not good for my taste. I need to learn more about this. Uh, and I didn't put out the answers in the way the book did them, even though I believe that I got them correctly. I kind of I struggle with, with these problems. Uh, but then when I got into the mappings themselves, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm understanding how they work. Uh, in the case of a, uh, oh, I, I'm not, I haven't gotten there, so yes, yeah, problem number four. Yeah, I went to Wikipedia, then I came back to the problem. Uh, then I uh, drew, got out some printouts, the identity theorem, and that all very interesting stuff. Then in section 7.2, uh, yeah, I, I got this right, but I didn't say it correctly, so I gave myself half credit. I, I try to grade myself a little harshly when I can, just to uh, motivate myself to work harder. Then when I got to, yeah, problem seven, I got right, the ellipse problem. Yeah, you just, uh, you break out, you do a parameter, uh, you do, you parameterize the topolar coordinates, and then when you break them out, you do get the row plus one of a row, row minus one of a row. I, I see where it comes from. Then when I hit problems eight and nine, which come in a pair, uh, problem eight is, uh, what happens with infinitesimal lengths, lengths and the magnitude of the derivative? Uh, wh what does that mean? And I could tell that it was a scaling factor. And so, because when it's, it mentioned, yeah, as a hint, use the difference quotient. Yes, I knew that the derivative with, for the W mapping and the derivative for Z, C mapping divided is really this derivative function, okay? Uh, and then it said, well... Uh, Tell us about the area, okay, the area of the domain and its relationship to the integral of the, uh, the square modulus of the derivative of the function. I was like, man, I thought about it and I was like, yeah, I don't really know. Uh, I, I, I couldn't have figured out this problem easily. It's not explained in the book, but this is where Alphers came in for the win and why I don't really know when I'm going to have time to do offers, but boy, was this like the, you know, 
eureka moment for, for the beauty of Alphurs and what a great book it is. I don't have it in this video, but I've shown it before. And so I went through Alphurs and sections 2.3 and section 2.4 of Alpha, Alphurs actually is this entire proof for problems 8 and 9 in gory detail and it truly in it all its glory. And so, yes, and I was even able to fill in the calculations for uh, the missing steps in Alphurs, which is I felt very proud of. But sure enough, um, you, uh, you set up these, uh, these operators and eventually you get a formula that is right here. So the arg of uh, z uh, prime t0 varies and it describes a circle having this radius. I could have never figured this out. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I could have never figured this out. So I read it, made notes of it. It even, it even goes a little bit into uh, Riemann surfaces because it talks about how the mapping may overlap, but think of it as a film. Uh, then the Jacobian comes in, looked it up in ChatGPT. Um, and then I also read a little bit in, in Nevalina and Patero, which I have, I have not shown in here. Uh, yeah, and so that this is, was actually problem 10. So problem 10 is explained in Nevalina and Patero the reasons why uh, for the, uh, the Riemann mapping theorem. You have the Z uh, plane and the W plane, and you cannot map one onto the other completely. You cannot. At least one of them has to have a point that is not in your domain. Uh, and the way that I liken it is when you're painting a room, you cannot paint under your feet. Right? And that's basically what I think it is, as I understand it. So if you want to paint the entire floor under you, you can paint the entire floor except your feet, but then at some point you got to move out and paint your feet, so you cannot do it all in one go. And I believe that that's a really good analogy for what's happening in the Riemann mapping theorem, that you've got to have a punctured plane in order to map to the other plane and vice versa. And that's what, that is explained in Navalina and Patero very, very well. I took notes, and then I kept going and I did 11 and I got it right. Uh, and I got this mostly right, except for one little thing, uh, problem 11. I got them all right. And there's more in here. But So that's my update. It's a long update because it's a two-week two update. But basically, I'm going to keep on going, uh, even though I finish reading the book.